Good morning, it is Sunday, February 19th, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we're coming back now to the book of Galatians and in chapter 5, begin with verse 16, We'll read down through verse 26. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We do so with grateful hearts, overwhelmed with thanksgiving for the riches of your grace and the great salvation that we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask for divine illumination in our hearts that we might know the truth and to have the great sense of freedom and liberty that is ours in Christ. And so we ask your blessing upon our time here this morning. Glorify yourself in all that is said and done. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so as we return to this passage after about a month away, uh, I think we need to reiterate some truth revealed in the gospel of the grace of God before continuing. An ignorance of grace and a failure to rightly divide the word of truth has produced a different gospel today, which is no gospel at all. And this is the occasion for the writing of this epistle, that the Galatians were, uh, many of them were turning to the law to try to justify themselves and others were turning to the law to try to maintain their salvation in some way. And so uh, the Apostle Paul writes earlier in the letter in Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Being deceived and blinded, I believe most people are religious without redemption. And many of the redeemed are ignorantly practicing law 
living under legalism rather than grace. Religion results in condemnation and legalism produces self-righteousness in the proud and insecurity in those who acknowledge their failure to attain righteousness. Those who believe and understand the unadulterated gospel of the grace of God have full assurance that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 1. And we know that God has reckoned us righteous by faith. Romans 4, 5. Christ is our life, Colossians 3, 4, and our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Now, these people, that, especially the redeemed, that don't see the pure gospel of the grace of God, are blinded, deceived. And I can see how that happens because I had an illustration happen to me this morning as I was focused on filling myself with this message. My wife said, don't forget to take your medicine because she was going to go and go to a, another church service and uh, it was a musical service today. And I heard her say that, but it didn't register. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there and she went so far as to say, well, I'll go get the medicine and I'll bring it out to you. And so I heard that, but it didn't really register. And she left. And I stayed focused in what I was doing. And then it came back to me. Oh, yeah, I've got to take my medicine. And so as I was getting up, the medicine was sitting right in front of me. And the water was on the desk right by, by the medicine. And I was astounded. How did that get there? <laughs> now, I know how I got there. But I never saw it, even though I had heard it, even though she told me she was going to do it, and she did it, I didn't see any of it. And that's sort of the way the gospel of the grace of God is today. People can hear it, they can talk about it, but unless they actually see it, they will remain blinded. And that will produce if we that do see it buy into the interchange, that can produce a lot of hostility. Uh, it can do it in the family, too, once in a while. She sometimes gets a little more exacerbated on the fifth or sixth time. Have you taken your medicine yet? It's a half an hour late now. <coughs> but anyway, in the, in the realm of spirituality, this same struggle goes on when, when there is this blindness to grace. I, I say pure grace or unadulterated grace, but grace is grace. And that's all there is to it. But I want to emphasize the fact that grace is pure and it won't tolerate any type of ad adulteration in it. It's just grace. And people are blinded to that. In this passage we just read, this thing here that says, uh, uh, let me find it again. Uh, in verse 21 of our passage, Paul says, and envy and drunkenness, orgies and the like, and then he says, I warn you. Well, that word warn is not in the definition in the Greek whatsoever. It means to predict or to speak forth. But man sees this as a warning. Well, it is a fact. It is the truth. But to believers in Jesus Christ, this is no warning. I'm past this. This is not a threat whatsoever or a warning to a believer in Jesus Christ, even a blinded believer, one that still thinks he has to live if he commits adultery or fornication or something. That, that I just use that sort of crude illustration or question recently about if you were to cheat on your wife and right in the middle of your act of cheating you had a heart attack would you go to heaven if you died well that shocks people that oh I don't know about that 
And then you just ask him some basic truths. Did Jesus Christ, how many of your sins did Jesus Christ die for? And they'll say, well, all of them. They can pop with that. And then you say, well, how about this one? Did he die for this one that you were committing? Yes. Well, then why do you hesitate to say, I'll go to heaven no matter what I do? Because Christ died for my sins. That's grace. Otherwise, you've let legalism slip in. And we all suffer from that in certain ways. We're, we all operate once in a while. Well, if I do this, God's going to do that. Or we think we're operating on that relationship. That's not grace. And so today, they have tried to refine it. And so the gospel of salvation to many are, you have to believe on Jesus Christ and make him Lord of your life. <clears throat> Making him Lord of your life has nothing to do with being saved. And that's what how legalism slips in. And so many people today say, well, you are saved by grace, but you have to keep good works. It is true that we are to do good works, but it has nothing to do with our salvation or being saved. The point I'd like to point out, and I hope I don't confuse you with this, but we live by the Spirit. And that word live has two components. It has our existence. And every believer in Jesus Christ today has their existence where? In Christ. That's living by the Spirit to be in Christ. We also live in our experience. By the Spirit. And that's what they're talking about when he talks about walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Uh, live by the Spirit in the NIV. Our experience is Christ living in us. And this is where the works come from as a believer. And so... In my existence, I am alive unto God. And so uh, I just want to review some doctrine about the doctrines of grace. And so uh, let's start with verse 18 of Galatians chapter 5. But if you are led, and that means to lead, to guide, direct, to move, impel. And it also deals with forces and influences on the mind. And so if all of that is going on by the Spirit, if you are living in the Spirit, you are not under law. In Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 9, you, however, are controlled. And that word controlled gives, a, I think, a false impression. We are not being robotically manipulated. Uh, when I think of that term, robotically manipulated, it reminds me last year I went to a, a man who was talking about robotics and robotic engineering and everything, and they are now doing heart surgeries remotely. Somebody 30 or 40 miles away is actually performing the surgery on a patient that has a robot doing the cutting and everything else. And this person, some distance away, is looking at the monitors and the screens and everything and can manipulate the robot with his movers much more precisely than he could if it were his own hands actually doing. There, there won't be any slips or anything. The robot has all that built in. And so, we're not being manipulated that way by the Spirit of God. It is a cooperative effort between God's will for your life, the Spirit applying whatever forces and thoughts and everything else to convince you of the truth of that purpose, and then we as believers responding to that truth by faith. And we'll go through that a little more detail later. But anyway, 
You, however, are controlled not by this sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But, or since Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Remember, Paul talks about that, that it's no longer he that does it, but sin that lives in him. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And I think that has a present application and also a future application when we're given a new body. But at the present time, I believe that the Spirit of God is the energizer in us. And so verse 12 of Romans 8, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation or a responsibility, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. You will shrivel up and shrink away. But if you by the Spirit, if you, or, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. And so, I've, as I mentioned, I don't believe being led by the Spirit implies that we are being manipulated almost like Ottomans, that we're just like puppets. It is, a, we're not being controlled in that fashion. I believe it is a cooperative process that begins as the Spirit of God illumines our minds to truth. And this is also important, I'm going to sidetrack for a little bit, but the unsaved person, being dead in trespasses and sins, has no access to God. He can't get to God because he's separated, he's dead in trespasses and sins. But that doesn't mean that God can't get to him because God is God. And we see it in the Old Testament where he dealt with people that weren't saved. And he can even do it through animals. And he could even do it through stones if he wanted to. Remember when Christ said something to the effect that if you don't praise and worship me, God could raise up these stones to do it. Something to that effect. And so God has that power because he is sovereign. He is God. But man doesn't have that power to get to God. But when you are saved by grace through faith, then it becomes a two-way street. We have access to God through Jesus Christ, and we stand in grace. And so, uh, in the elect's case, those that will be saved, being thus convinced of the gospel of our salvation, and trusting Christ, who died for our sins, the Spirit of Christ continues to enlighten the eyes of our hearts, producing an enhanced desire in the believer to respond in obedience. In other words, the Spirit of God is working in us. And God has ordained good works in every believer's life. In Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, Paul prays to that end. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And then in Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all all men. It teaches, and that's a present active verb, meaning it disciplines or trains us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And so here are some factual declarations of the Word of God. Uh, in my conversations with people, I find a lot of people that are very biblically knowledgeable. In other words, they can uh, tell you what the Bible says. They can tell you all about the, all the Old Testament stories, about Noah, about the flood, about uh, Moses and the Ten all kinds of biblical knowledge but it's not actually according to truth. If that knowledge doesn't understand the pureness of grace and the word of God rightly divided, you can speak truth and be wrong in your application of it. And so that's why it's so important to not just know these things are in the Bible, but to make the right application in your personal faith. And so number one, when you trusted Christ, you were sealed by the Spirit of God. Anybody that doesn't understand grace and that salvation is by grace through faith, they can quote that verse. You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I have a t-shirt with that on the front of it. Now you have people tell me all the time, Oh, I love that verse. And then I turn around and show them the second one. That all men might see the fellowship of the mystery. And they've never seen that verse. They're like me sitting at that computer. It's been put right in front of their face. And they look at it and don't see it. Because the Spirit of God has not illumined their eyes to that yet. If you see that today, if you understand that today... That's why the praise and the glory goes to God. You don't understand that because you studied your Bible more than they had. That's not why you understand it. You understand it because the Spirit of God has illumined your heart to it. And so I encourage you to not get exacerbated and frustrated with those who don't agree with what you believe. And don't get exasperated with me if I believe differently than you do. You will stand before God one day. I will stand before God one day. And we'll each receive our rewards as believed, redeemed people. But anyway, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now there's a lot of people that don't believe that you, anybody can be eternally secured in no. Well, I disagree with that. I believe the Bible teaches it and I believe I know it by faith. And so... Those that might not know it, I'm not saying they're not saved, but those who deny it raises a question in my life. Not that that makes any difference to anybody else because I don't have any impact on them. But the fact is that if you believe that you have to do something to keep your salvation, then maybe you haven't really believed and trusted in Christ to be sufficient. To save you. And so people say, oh, you're going to destroy somebody's faith. If I can destroy their faith, it wasn't true faith. Because a human being doesn't have that power to destroy anybody's faith. And so going on here, when you trusted Christ, you were baptized into the body of Christ. Due to a lack of Biblical knowledge concerning right division, baptism has taken on a very pronounced and perverted meaning today in its importance for believers and members of the body of Christ. Many people believe, some believe you have to be water baptized to be saved. 
Again, that's contrary to the gospel of salvation. That's a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. But if you believe that you should be water baptized and follow Christ uh, as he conducted his life here on earth, again, I would submit that I believe you are ignorant. Now, don't get upset. That doesn't mean you're dumb or anything. It just means you don't know what the Bible truly teaches. Because Jesus Christ was a perfect Jew living under the law, sent to redeem those that were under the law. It wasn't until Paul's message in the revelation given to him by the ascended, glorified Lord Jesus Christ do we hear that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, we knew he was going to die for the sin of the world. That's presented. But that really was sort of part and parcel of his message, that if you embrace me as Messiah... If you believe I am the Son of God, if you believe I am the Messiah, the King, you'll receive the forgiveness of sins. And so it wasn't the focus of the message. It was just part of the message. But the real focus was the ministry and message of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One, here to redeem Israel. And he lived his life his entire life, flawlessly, sinlessly, under the law. And so, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, this is back to baptism. I don't know how I got so much into that. But you were baptized into the body of Christ. This one will really shake people up if you ask them, uh, how many times have you been baptized? And most of them will say once or maybe twice. And I tell people, I was baptized three times. And once I didn't even know it. Well, Paul, remember when Paul went to Mars Hill and they had all kinds of statues and stuff for all the gods and they even had one statue to the unknown God so that they could have their bases covered. And so they were even worshiping him. Well, that thing, same thing's true today. That many people are focused on water baptism, but we've all, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been baptized not with the Spirit, but by the Spirit into the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. In the gospel of the grace of God that was revealed to the apostle Paul, in the Jewish religion, they had many baptisms. In Paul's gospel, there is one baptism. And this is it right here. In Ephesians, he says there's one faith, one hope, one baptism. Now, again, these are declarations directly from the Word of God. And to show you how blinded people can be, as I've said many times, I've shared these with people, and they say, well, I can't argue with you because you're showing me right here, but I don't believe it. They are still blinded to the reality of these truths. And so sometimes I'll ask people, how many times you met? They'll say once, and they tell me about how they got water baptized and everything. And then I tell them, and this is where I try to be as cautious and prepare them as much as possible. But I say that they explained or showed me all about how they were one time baptized in water. And I say to them, if you're sure that's the only time you've been baptized, then you're not saved. And boy, you can see the hackles or whatever they call it go up on them. Their body language changes and they're ready to fight. You're telling me I'm not saved? And I didn't say that. I said, if that's the only time you've been baptized, you're not saved. And then I show them these verses like this. And there's so much in the Word of God because people are blinded to this that I've had one pastor uh, say to me, every time the word baptism is used in the Bible, it's talking about water baptism. Unless 
the Spirit is mentioned right in with it. But that's just simply not the truth in the gospel of the grace of God. Water, baptize, water baptism got nobody into the body of Christ. Water baptism had nothing to do with being buried with Christ. Even though they use that imagery as they dip somebody down, they say you're buried with Christ. Water baptism didn't raise anybody up to walk in newness of life. That's all the work of the Spirit of God in his baptismal work of putting us into Christ, identifying us with the work of Christ. So that we were we died with Christ at Calvary, we bet through our baptism into his death. We were buried with him in baptism. Because we're in Christ, we were buried with him. And we have been raised up with Christ because of our union or identity as members of the body of Christ. And so you were sealed by the Spirit of God, you were baptized into the body of Christ, and when you trusted Christ, you were justified freely by his grace. And remember that word freely means without any cause in yourself. God is the just one and the justifier of those who believe in, in Jesus. And so 1 Corinthians, uh, or Romans 3.24 says, And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And I am convinced that the Holy Spirit, being God, is sovereign and is in complete control of all things, especially and particularly in the life of his saints. But I do not believe he is micromanaging our existence and our experience. I believe he allows us great latitude in the choices we make. But he does not have, but he does have certain predestined, foreordained events and outcomes that will be accomplished. There are certain things that will be accomplished in every believer's life. As mentioned earlier, it is in grace that the Spirit of God is disciplining us or training us. Philippians 2.13 tells us, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out. And that is a command to be in the present, and it's a middle passive. Be doing the things that will bring about your salvation. That's not referring to being the salvation to be made alive in Christ. It's talking about our experience now. We are being saved by God moment by moment as we live in this present evil world. We are kept by the power of God. And so it goes on to say here that work it out with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. And so again, that is the cooperative process through which the Spirit of God illumines our hearts, convinces us of the truth, and we respond in faith that leads to a desire to be an obedient servant. And this continual spiritual transformation is working to produce in every believer a yielded, willing saint who is desirous to do God's will, who is desirous for God's purpose and takes no credit for any of the outcome, but all the glory goes to God. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, the Apostle Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I think he's talking about in his existence and in his experience both. 
And his grace to me was not without effect. Now he's really focused on his experience. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 6, 18, the Apostle Paul shows his dependence in the importance of prayer and submitting and yielding ourselves in submission to God. And I pray in this, and no, he's telling the Ephesians, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me. Paul wants him to realize that even though he's been given this abundance of revelation, even though it's man's nature to put certain people on pedestals because of their skills or talents or calling or whatever it might be, Paul is pointing out that he needs the same prayer they do. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And so it is my conviction that the Spirit of God is not negligent in his ministry and work in our lives, in the lives of believers, in his transforming work in us. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed, and I, I, I didn't do this right here, but it's, I, I bet the farm that it is a present passive verb, meaning that it's a continuous action by the Spirit in our lives that is transforming us, and we're passive in it. It's the Spirit of God that's doing it into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And therefore, I believe being led by the Spirit or, being, uh, or walking in the Spirit is a continuous, cooperative maturation process that results in growth on the part of the believer. It is initiated, sustained, and empowered by God and brought to fruition through faith and through the power of the Spirit of God. In grace, God has made provision that we grow up in Christ and walk worthy of our calling. And then let's look at one of the means by which he puts all this together for the church, the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11. He who descended, referring to Christ, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he, Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. Now, reading all of that, you could almost go through most of the Bible and apply all that to in the Bible. He raised up Noah, he raised up Gideon, he raised up David, Moses, all those people. But here Paul identifies what all of this is actually referring to. 
to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. He's talking about today in the church, the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is the spiritual goal that God has for every believer and member of the body of Christ. And I'm of the opinion that that will not be consummated until the Bema seat of Christ when we're given our new bodies from heaven and all of these things will be done away with forever. That is the redemption of our bodies. And when that happens, the adoption will be finalized or completed. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. It'll take that long up till that point before this will happen. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so that is the present process today. Each member of the body of Christ fulfilling its God-ordained role is building up this body until it's completed and consummated and we're taken off the earth. And so the point I'd like to make as we prepare for next week's message about uh, don't let any of this be going on in your life, or you won't inherit the kingdom of God and have all this going on so you're doing these positive good things, it's important to understand that our experience is the result of our existence as a believer in Christ. Our existence had nothing to do with that experience. We were dead in trespasses and sins, we got saved, our existence became alive in Christ, and we started living in accordance with our existence. When we start to look at our experience here, we do deeply err if we think that experience over here has anything to do with the bringing of our existence into reality. It just doesn't. And that's what grace is all about. And so next week when we talk about all these horrendous works of the flesh, that's our experience on this side. It doesn't have anything to do with this. And so don't think, and that's why the unpardonable sin is a big fear for a lot of people. Or how many of these do you have to do before God will set you aside? Or what do you have to do to uh, fall away or backslide? I mean, that's all ignorance of the true gospel of the grace of God. And they're all Satan's tools to deceive and disrupt and destroy your joy and peace in Christ. And so don't let it deceive or fool you as the Satan comes as an angel of light or his angels become ministers of righteousness it's deception it's not the true gospel and when you see this true gospel in its purity it does bring an amazing peace and a great rest in christ let's pray our dear heavenly father we bow before the truth of your word and through the revelation of the gospel of your grace to us who at one time were recognized as heathen dogs that we were uh, called uncircumcised 
that we were without hope. But now in Christ, we've been brought near. And so let us rejoice in your amazing grace and all that that has brought to us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.